Welcome to the second video in this series on disorders of the cardiovascular system where we're looking at it from the perspective of the various blood vessels or the various aspects of the circulation. So we've looked at the pulmonary arteries here taking blood from the right ventricle through to the lung or to the lungs and we've noticed when you might get raised pulmonary arterial pressure. In this clip we want to consider the systemic arteries. So what diseases affect systemic arteries? Well we notice the normal blood pressure in the systemic arterial system is 120 over 80 millimetres of mercury. 120 systolic, 80 diastolic. Or well, that might be a blood pressure that you typically find. If you're young and fit your blood pressure may be quite a bit lower than that. That's, that's acceptable. In fact, it's good. So we're thinking about uh, systemic arteries. These are the arteries that break down and take blood to all of the body, apart from the lungs. All the systems of the body receive their blood supply via the aorta. The first two vessels right down here that actually leave the aorta are the coronary arteries, the right and left coronary artery taking blood to the myocardium itself. So we notice the normal blood pressure there and there's a common condition called hypertension. Hyper of course is high, tension means pressure. So blood pressure can be too high. Now this can be a primary, also called essential. Hypertension, or it can be secondary. Now this is the same with quite a few diseases. A secondary condition is one which is caused by something else. Whereas a primary condition is one which just arises without apparent cause. So for example, secondary hypertension is often caused by renal problems. The kidney is very closely involved in control of blood pressure. Problems in the kidney can give rise to hypertension. But other times you get your blood pressure checked and it's a bit high and that can maintain um, forever if you, if you develop it, primary hypertension. It doesn't seem to be caused by any underlying pathology. It seems to start with the blood pressure itself. So it's also called essential hypertension. Both of these can be dangerous because high blood pressure is, um, is not a good thing to have. This one's probably, most cases, are probably because, because, because the kidney produces too much renin. And as you might know from other learning, that affects the renin angiotensin system, which we do deal with in, in other videos. So it's very important for you to detect high, hypertension by checking the blood pressure. It's important to remember that the main clinical feature of hypertension is that there are no clinical features of hypertension. The most important clinical feature of hypertension is that there isn't any, we detect it by taking the blood pressure. And that's because blood pressure is auto-regulated throughout a wide variety of pressures. So with a blood pressure of 90 or a blood pressure of 160, the amount of blood going to your brain, for example, should be auto-regulated. So very often people are hypertensive but don't feel any um, don't feel any adverse effects from that. We have to check it. So taking blood pressure is an essential part of every physical assessment it has to be. Now if the blood pressure is raised we've got effective medications that can treat it. We've got a range of medications that can treat it angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, even beta blockers, even diuretics. We've got a wide range of medication and we've got well-established protocols for treating hypertension and we can usually manage to bring the blood pressure down to highly acceptable levels.
But if we don't, if we don't, the problem is the hypertension causes complications. There are complications associated with hypertension. And these can develop silently because the patient may not be aware there's anything wrong with them. Now the hypertension can occur on its own or it can occur with obesity or it can occur with the metabolic syndrome where it can be associated with dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, particularly in patients with abdominal obesity. But it can, it can just present on its own. There's a genetic component sometimes, but, but again, not necessarily. And there are complications. One of the complications is atheroma. Develops in the blood vessels, the disease process of atherosclerosis. There can be atherosclerosis. Now, if the blood pressure here is high, what's that going to do to the right, the left ventricular workload? If the pressure in the systemic arteries is high, can you see that means it's going to be harder for the left ventricle to contract, to pump the blood out against the increased outflow resistance. There will be an increased afterload. It was the same with the pulmonary arteries. When there was pulmonary arterial hypertension, that increased right ventricular workload. When there's systemic arterial hypertension, the left ventricle has to pump harder to pump the blood into the systemic arteries. Now, for a while it can do that, there can be enlargement of the left ventricular myocardium, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, this condition is a hypertrophy because when you exercise a muscle, the muscle will get bigger. Like if you go to the gym and start working out, your muscles will get bigger. But that's because the individual cells get larger. It's a hypertrophy. There's not an increase in the number of cells. And over time, well, to begin with, the left ventricular hypertrophy will compensate. But then over time, the left ventricular hypertrophy will lead to left ventricular failure. So we'll get heart failure, start as left ventricular failure. So that will lead to heart failure. And if the left ventricle fails, if the left ventricle is not pumping the blood out properly, then that will mean that there's some blood left in the left ventricle at the end of systole. That's going to make it harder for the blood to get from the left atrium into the left ventricle. That means the blood is going to find it harder to get from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. There's going to be a damming back. So because the blood's not effectively pumped out of here because the left ventricle is failing, the blood will dam back to here, will dam back to here. So you're going to get a pulmonary venous hypertension and that can result in pulmonary edema. So the left ventricular failure can result in pulmonary edema. Just the same way as the right ventricular failure means the blood is going to dam back and that can cause pulmonary edema. If you follow the circulation back this time, you follow the path of the congestion. And left ventricular failure does not have a good prognosis. It's a very serious condition. The kidney is like a, a, a constant blood pressure, so there can be renal complications as a result of hypertension. And another big risk is, is stroke. Cerebrovascular. Cerebrovascular accident, one of the primary causes of that is, is hypertension. So very important that the pressure in the systemic arteries does not become too high, so the person does not become hypertensive and therefore will not suffer the complications, of which we've just sketched out a few here. Now, if you 
recognise the hypertension and treat it, you can prevent these complications and other complications. There's many more complications. Dementia, for example, is more common. So you can prevent this as long as you detect it. So that is one condition affecting the systemic arteries. The next condition on the next video clip we want to look at also affecting the systemic arteries is this disease process of atherosclerosis, which is still one of the major causes of premature death and suffering in the Western world. And unfortunately is becoming more and more common in developed countries as well.